Ruiz. wanted to jump back to how radio formed uh with ray um you know because okay. those first two albums especially for me were fire you know so <laughs> tell us about that you was getting you was getting a hardcore buddy you know and like i said uh i'll get him in touch with you too uh i still see ray he is my brother you know uh he was upstairs i was downstairs we went on tour together uh, Ray uh, uh, moved out here after Stevie was out here all the time. I followed later because Ray is one of those people who don't mind driving. So he would hop in that car. That was the first time we didn't do something together. I said, man, I am not getting in the car driving to California. And he did it, I think, maybe one stop from Detroit. He drove out here with yeah. his guitar. Hey, that's how it was. Got popular out here doing studio work. And he was telling me how much money he was making. He got real tight with Barry White. He's on all that Barry White stuff, and that's where he met Wawa. Herbie and, Hancock, yeah. Yeah, all that. See, that's how all that stuff came. All of us became friends. But anyway, so I'm like, okay, I'm coming out there. But I hopped on the plane. I gave a tip to the Skycap back in the day, the Skycap. And I literally moved on the airplane. <laughs> I said, hey, man, here's some money, man. Put this on here. Uh, get my stuff to uh, um, California. So I started doing studio work. Ray decided he wanted to write because he picked that up from Stevie. Stevie was always showing us how to write. Every time we would get in a hotel, Stevie would have the role guy set up his little stuff in his room. That boy never not stopped doing music. He's always doing music. And Ray picked up on that and, and you know, he started writing. So he wrote you got the love um, for Shaka. Yeah. Okay. And Stevie produced Tell Me Something Good out of Irvine, California. And we went out there, and that's how that came together with Shaka. So after Ray uh, wrote Jack and Jill and was doing a lot of studio work, he ran into a guy, producer named uh, Richard Perry. He heard Ray's song, I gotta go real fast because it's so much. Uh, he heard Jack and Jill and wanted to cut it on, who, what's the guy that did it? You make me feel like dancing. Leo Sayer? Yeah. Richard was producing him, and I think he either wanted for him or Dan Ross, put it like this. At that time, he was producing a lot of acts, and he thought that song was killer and a great song. And then I said, yeah, I guess it is. And Ray said, um, uh, should, should, should I let him produce on the artist? I said, no, man, you was doing that for you. And he'll tell you. I, I stopped that. I said, I said, if you're going to give him that record done, then give it to me and I'll produce it. Because that's going to be your, your, your hit song. So that's the one thing about me and Ray. When I would step out of line, he would grab me. He made me do the Arlen and Jerry situation. You know, we'll get back to that. And then uh, I grabbed Ray and said, Ray, this is your, your song. You should do it, man. It's, it's done. It's nothing to do. So he listened to me on that, got with Clive Davis, and then it was on uh, radio. And those were just guys all from Detroit, uh, Vincent and Arnell Conrad. He's, Arnell's he's been on the show, there. yeah. Yeah, they're all still there, so we had radio. Ray got to be so big, and, you know, it always happened. Clyde Davis uh, saw the talent because he would meet with Ray. And, you know, when Clyde here hit, he's on it. And he made it because they were going, 
oh man, this is not R and B enough, and they were mad because he said I can't get it on the radio. And Clyde, they said, you better go back out there. You want your job? So we would be in the truck hearing it, and that sucker blew up so much. And then radio took off on Jack and Jill. Then Clyde came up with the idea. That's called a Ray Parker Jr. and radio. And that's how the not division, but that's how it starts. And trust me. That's how it starts with everyone. The good news is for me, I've always been in the midst of it and sort of behind the scene, and I saw it from Lionel Richie being in the studio when I was doing all that comedy stuff. So a lot of people don't know, uh, I was in the studio, I did that song Machine Gun. People don't know that was me. There was a Commodore's name, but that was more studio driven. That record took off in Japan. Okay, then it got big here and they started paying no attention. But Lionel has always been a killer writer and was sharing with him. So the animosity in this case wasn't Lionel, well, I'm writing on those songs, so I need to just do my solo album. No, people were are not picking the hit record because it was him having too many songs on the album or something. I'm like, shut up and write. You're doing the tour. If he's writing his, let him write it. And then Ray started writing his stuff and saying, man, Ali, you need to go ahead and do more writing on your material, and you have your name out there. Oh, wait, one, let me so, hold on one second, Ali. Did, did you uh, tour it all with radio? Because I saw them open for, yeah. for Bootsy in 78 at the Forum, and that was a fantastic show. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, what happened as Ray... When Ray started off with radio, I was just like loaded. Again, we always stayed together, but man, I was loaded with doing studio work in, in, in California, even when I slowed down. When you out of sight, out of mind kind of stuff, your stuff can drop. And I was, it was, it had to be later when I could afford to go out because I would have lost so much money. But let me tell you how that happened because this, what happened was when Ray's uh, record started taking off so much, it was a demand for him to go to Japan. He had never been to Japan. Ray didn't really have a band because it had became Ray Parker Jr. and radio or just uh, Ray Parker Jr. So there was no set band all the time because they were in Detroit, some of them was out here, and I was out here to do studio work, but not tour. It was taking too much. When he went to Japan, I want, he and Ray won excellent. So I was instrumental in getting Freddie Washington, the bass player. I put the band together for him to do live stuff, mainly for that Japan trip. Then we started doing stuff in the city. You know, we came back and did, I think we did the State Fairground. It's a big promoter. He's a jazz promoter. We did uh, in Detroit, if you can think of his name. He plays saxophone. He does all the um, music, jazz uh, festivals in Detroit. Can you think of his name? I can't think of it. But anyway, he's popular, so I did after Japan, I was touring at times uh, with Ray because the studio work had dropped. I had got into real estate and stuff, which I'm in now. And, and are we talking so, the early 80s right now? Okay, let me see. I got the live thing. I'm trying to think because I can, uh, let me tell you what was out. Was it, was it before break-in or after that you're talking? After. Oh, after. Okay, so... Yeah, because, oh, that's that's a good way to judge, because I remember how much action I would get after the show we would do autographs, and a guy walked up to me with my album. He had heard that I was playing drums with Ray, that they would mention my name. We played the Blue Note in Japan, and he walked up to me, and he was showing me an album got one in here that he brought in. I had never seen that album cover. Uh, it was from the Electric Boogaloo, uh, Breaking 2, Electric Boogaloo. Mm. 
And so I said, I signed it. And he said, um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I've always admired your records. You know, I'm saying, well, did you like the show with us? He's like, yeah. I just wanted to get an autograph from you since you was in the show. And I said, thank you. Because when you go to Japan, they leave, they read a lot. Okay, the credits and stuff, and they're really on top. I would walk off the, even when I went with Quincy, that happened to me. They would come up with my albums because, you know, they know who's coming in time. They're into and it. They over, yeah. yeah, overseas, it was really good to mix up your stuff because I went to, uh, talking about doing live stuff with him, I, when I went to was it, Switzerland, we did uh, the Mon, Mantra. Ma, Ma, yeah. Uh, jazz festival and that was just recently Ray popped over there for something they were doing announcing his who you're going to call documentary that you should keep your ears open from that he just uh, I got to deal with uh, CBS that's going to we 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 shot that a while back but uh, just recently if you check uh, his Facebook page you'll see them mentioning uh, it's called Who You Gonna Call. But all that race stuff came from us growing up together, trying to do more in the business, supporting one another. Because, like I said, I had to leave the city for a while to go out and do that. But then when he started doing one offs afterward, it still got back. Even like right now, I don't tour with him, you know, because I'm doing so many other things business wise. <laughs> How, how did the Ollie and Jerry opportunity to come up? I, you know, I remember mm -hmm. seeing that movie in the theater, uh, and then of course the song became a hit. But uh, how did that opportunity come up for you? Well, that happened when, um, again, <laughs> man, my life is. I, I promise you guys, I'm gonna do a book because you can't squeeze it in. Because I, I forget and thank God. You guys uh, can only answer because there's so many things I've been so blessed with and I have to use that because the story with that, it was a case that you guys don't hear about where someone pulled their song. Almost like what happened with Ray. They, the, the breaking movie, they were fighting over who was going to have the first release because that was when record companies started doing these soundtracks like Footloose and you name all these big music. Well, Purple Rain came out that same year. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, let, let me then keep that in this conversation. I'll tell you what happened with me. So what happened is they needed a song. The movie's coming out that next week. Me and Jerry was friends through Ray Parker. And I told Jerry, I, I got a chance to write a uh, song for this movie, you know, I I wasn't thinking how that it would be anything. It's just a, I was just excited to be doing music for music and writing it, and I had a chance to produce it because they had no one, and so they wasn't being picky. So what happened was there was no artist. I wasn't an artist. I was just a studio musician that wrote songs and started producing records. You know, because I did that Sarita album, Billy Preston, with uh, Sarita Duet, you know, a lot of my stuff with Latoya, you name it. But what happened was I didn't have a singer. And Jerry had a solo album on A&M Records. I forgot the per name Perfect of it. fit. He had that perfect fit hit. There you yeah. go. And, and, you know, Jerry did all that uh, new edition stuff and uh, the Jets. Remember the Jets on yeah. MCA? Yeah, family. Okay, act. Jerry. Yeah. yeah, he's always been a good writer and a talented guy. So we collaborated on a song. We just walked in the room, had nothing in mind, and we went for it. My little drum machine again, like I said, I put that sucker down, and we started playing on it. And uh, then they called me, and I had another day where I had a chance to see where the song was going to go. And that's how I got to be friends with Shabadoo later in the movie, he came, they had a scene where my song is really put out is when they were being judged by the judges. Now that I'm telling you this, go to that scene, you're gonna see the judge uh, sitting at the table with the lady and they listening, and Shabdu walks up to the table and he gets mad and he rips off his stuff that's in there, and, and he say, they can't stop us. And then I went, 
there's no summer. And and I came up with the lyric idea uh, watching the movie, which I, I love doing, uh, picking stuff out of there to inspire me to do stuff. And fast forwarding, when I started getting other material, when they wanted more songs, I want you to look at street people. Street people on the breaking movie that I did, I put the group together again because I had no artist, this material, and it was the producer. We did that, and the next thing you know, you had Firefox. Listen to that song. That song is three scenes put together, which had three different songs. So I had to write three different temples. So the way I created it was when it got picked up, when you hear it goes faster and stuff, I went club on it and made it more up tempo, like the scene was where the song, so I could clock the music. I had to slide my uh, music pretty much under their feet so they could dance. It wasn't like you do when you scoring, where you have a click track to work with time, so you can measure the times per beat. I had to create a section so it makes sense for all of a sudden to be so much energy mm. and then bring it down. So I edited it, I put that song together, and now that I told you that, I bet you you can look at it and see the three sections of the song that I created. Guarantee you. Yeah, we'll definitely have and to do that's that. how that song came together, man. Wow. Yeah. We're, and I miss, I miss my Oscar. Uh, yeah, Oscar, because all three of us, funny enough, from Detroit, Ray had Ghostbusters, I had uh, Breaking, There's No Stopping Us, Stevie had Woman in Red. That's right. Everybody got nominated but me, and I had the biggest record at the time. <laughs> Guess why I didn't get it? Um, MGM and Menachem Gohim, who had the film, was not a signatory to after uh, uh, the um, a SAG. So it wasn't technically certified to qualify to be nominated. So technicality, I went, you basically. Gotta be. I was like, so man, because I would have won. Because at that time, my record was bigger than everyone else's in terms of the nominations gone. They eventually sold more records, you know, as time went on. But at the time, in terms of voting and stuff, I was up there. I didn't get to be number one on the pop charts because of Purple Rain. Mm. That's the story I said I was going to get into. Purple Rain was number one. Uh, number two was me. And Weeks, if you look at the Billboard charts when it was number one, you're going to see me right underneath it, week after week after week. I didn't have the muscle. My movie wasn't as big, and he was under Warner Brothers, and they was making sure he stayed up there. Then Warner Brothers came out with Sheila E. Uh, on, uh, yeah, on the dance chart. What was her? Gla Glamorous Life. I mean, so anyway, so I'm looking at the charts, waiting on my turn, because um, Prince was there first, so I was just waiting for it to die down. I was holding my own, and I was at, Prince was at number one, I was at number two, so I was just sitting there. And I was getting sales to maintain. Then all of a sudden, I noticed Sheila was coming up behind her. We laughed about that. She's coming behind her. Man, I'm not kidding you, because I know how politics is. I picked up the phone, I said, guys, I've been sitting at number two, and uh, I know Warner Brothers is a big spender up there. That said, I need to see my regular number one. I don't want to see Sheila Lee drop in front of me and I being at number two for more than three or four weeks and I don't get to see it because y'all are playing some politics. I said, I'm not saying anything, but things need to happen. After that phone call, that following week, after Prince jumped, they moved me up properly so I can get it. I got it on my wall right now, so I got to see my record as number one. Because other than that, I didn't I didn't get a chance to see it on the pop chart. I did see it 
on the um, the dance charts. You would see it in Billboard. But that's what happened, man. If it was going too far, I'm like, wait a minute, because I it was it was kind of like time for Chris to fall off and drop another single, and he wasn't. And I'm like, okay, GD is coming up way too fast. I know I was been singing uh, selling more records and stuff. I just was stuck. But it, again, it didn't stop my check. <laughs> <laughs> how how'd you feel? How, how'd you feel about being in the limelight suddenly after being a behind the scenes guy all the time? Hey, living in California, driving, I'm being funny, driving over, uh, let's see, that was Coldwater Canyon, and your record pop on, and you're changing station, you know, back in the days where they had buttons, you go station, it can cause you to drive off a cliff. <laughs> That's how you do it, man. It, it is, you can't explain it. I was I, honestly, I, I remember I was going over Coldwater Canyon, the sunset, coming from the valley, and you know how you go all those curves and stuff. I my record came on, and I was listening to it, and then when it went off, I pushed the button. It was on another station. Then I went. Then I just got curious. Then I would push another station. It was like on three stations almost at the same time, and getting back to how that feel opening night because i only had two days to get this thing out it was coming out that sunday i had to sit by a uh, mix and everything it was in westwood theater kids were lined up around the, the theater i was able to get in there i ended up having to sit in the back because they were flooding the place i found out later that's where the producers want to be anyway so it turned out good. So I'm sitting at the back of the theater, and you hear the drum machine, like at the beginning of it, going, shh, shh, they're coming on. To see those kids jump out of their seat, not at a club, in the theater was the best thing I'll never forget. I just wish I could have had it on tape, because you have to remember, that's the first time for everybody, including me, sitting on the, uh, on the uh, big screen, but my record, was in the streets before the movie so it was like a little teaser so they knew because when they when they came on the uh, screen and he started writing on the wall like that those kids was in the aisle dancing in the theater well you know it was a, it was a staple for me because i was a dj in los angeles throughout the 80s and i was part so of you the, know uh, impact uh and resource record pool which was the black music record pool for los yeah, angeles yeah, yeah. So I was all over, man, with that extended, uh, you know, mix. That's and, good, man. Yeah, yeah. That's it. So yeah. you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And, uh, and now, that, now that you're telling me that, I want you to go back and look at one of your extended ones. You're going to hear the melody played on like a synthesizer. And that's when they were letting, you remember the days when they started letting certain people remix our product? Mm -hmm. Okay. Without you asking, I was a little mad at it. Fortunately, it came out good on one of those remakes. But he left in because he didn't know my master. That's when a record labels, you know, you would get him your working master, which I never do anymore for that very reason. When they gave the uh, the remix, I might know what I'm remixing, but at least tell me and let me know because I would have told him that wasn't a part of the song. That melody was on air for Jerry when we had when we was writing the melody for the song. So he had laid it as a synthesizer. It's still in the remix. Yeah. Listen to it. It is supposed to be there. <laughs> <laughs> wow, definitely will listen for that again. <laughs> Well, you can't stop a hit. You can't stop a hit, man. No. Well, and you know what? That movie wasn't bad. That movie was okay. Oh, oh yeah. 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 Hey, hey. Um, it it allowed me to negotiate better when we did Electric Boogaloo. Okay, the story behind that, they got a producer. They got the person that wrote the theme song and hit songs off of there. So Russ Regan, who was the head of NR for Polygram Records, uh, allowed me to do Breaking Two. I got to meet the crew before they shot the movie 
and I can like mail it this time. I got to meet Menachem uh, Go, who owned um, uh, the film um, and executives for MGM. So we're sitting at the round table. And one of the things that came up was, uh, and this is the big, I won't use no names, so I won't gossip. He goes, Ollie, you did pretty good on that uh, record. I said, yeah, it, it sold a lot of product. He said, mm-hmm. So maybe I need to participate in some of the publishing rights on the song. And I went, I looked at him and every, all these big executives and everybody is in the room. And so I looked down the table, this really happened. And I don't have no shame to say it. That, that means stand up for what you know. You believe in your product. I'm not going to sell out. Yes, I'm happy, but everyone won. So why are you jumping on my bandwagon? So he goes, I'm going to have to participate in it. And I looked at him and I said, all right. If you want to participate in my music that I did, then you let me get cut inside the movie. Give me a percent of the movie. Mm -hmm. And he laughed, and everybody else was in their chair like this. <laughs> he didn't say that, did he? And you know what he said? I like you. Okay? So we negotiated something. I didn't get in the movie, but it wasn't what he was trying to get, only because I stood up. And he said it in front of everybody there that thought I was crazy. He said, I like you because I said that to him. You know? And I wasn't being arrogant. I was just being a businessman. You know? I had no manager. Well, I think it was also because you had been in the business long enough to know better. <laughs> right. But they are try. You know? <laughs> it's like, okay, um, they forget who got you that trophy, so you the champions, and all of a sudden you don't have a say, and now I want to get some of your... French benefits and stuff, basically. You know, you didn't actually know, probably when I saved your button, you didn't have no song. And they had snatched the rights to put it out because the record companies were fighting on who was going to get the first release on the record coming out. But that's what happened. They couldn't come to agreement, so they pulled their song, this this record label. So uh, I had to you run save, the You saved their ass, basically. I did. Yeah. Because they had no theme song, man. Yeah. They, 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 they literally pulled the song. I had two days to do. I did not go to sleep. I went to the studio, me and Jerry. We wrote it in the studio. We finished it in the studio. There was no Ollie and Jerry. That was just the name we had to come up with. It didn't exist. And we did it. I turned it in. Uh, no, I recorded uh, probably Friday. I'm just going to say Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I had to have mixed. I met with them on that Monday. That that record had to be put together and put out uh, that next weekend. Because it was coming out that weekend. And like I said, I I wrote that on the, on the spot. At the scene, I, I, just I, at the, I think in talking to you that you do your best work under pressure, you know? I mean, the Stevie Wonder medley yeah, and, and right the Ollie and Jerry. And... <laughs> yes, same thing. Pressure. Yeah. Like, like, um, um, uh, and I, and you know, I love sports. Uh, uh, LeBron James was, what did he, he was saying, you know, he loved what he's doing, and he's gonna bring it best no matter what. Is this what he is just built to do? And that's how I am about my production, and when I want to do something, like I said, even with the Stevie thing, they were trying to think. Well, uh, are you okay with well, No, let's go. If he don't like me, he don't like me. I don't care about if the guy's from New York or, or Chicago or whatever. I'm going to bring Ali Brown and hopefully he'll like my stuff. And the same thing with that record, man. I went in the studio, didn't have even really seen the movie stuff, but when they had me come down to see the theme song, the uh, Firefox and all that stuff came during that week. Think about it. I had to put that together, too. Wow. You know, yeah. when I was looking over your incredibly impressive list of credits, Ollie, and, you know, it's it's a kick for me because for so many years, you know, I always scoured the liner notes, and I saw your name so yeah. many times, and I was like, wow, this guy's got his finger in everything. But um, you, you know, really worked with a lot of the all-time great female singers, I noticed, you know, from... Minnie Ripperton to um, uh, uh, who are some of the other ones that I uh, 
Patty, uh, uh, Patty Austin. Yeah, so I, uh, did that for, I did that for Quincy because he was so busy. He gave me again uh, the opportunity to produce. It's the, it's, it's the all I can tell you. It's the album where it's black and she got a cat on it. Whatever the name of that one is, Pat, with Patty Austin. Okay. So you 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 know how to find it, but. Man, like I said, thank God for you guys, because the, the DJs, y'all could, again, we did liner notes so you can have interviews like this. Yeah. I can't even remember some of these titles sometimes. Well, you, of course, Riverdale. you worked with uh, uh, Angela Winbush and... Um, yeah, and, and to Renee. Yeah. Uh, and I, Renee was in Alibaba when I did my solo album. Oh, and uh, Angela was like a background singer. <laughs> and Minnie Riverton came from uh, Stevie doing, because I did the Perfect Angel album. That's me on drums on that with Stevie, where she had the ice cream. Yeah. yeah. That's how that came together with uh, Minnie. Wow, so, it's a real uh, six, six degrees of separation kind of story. Same with Sly Stone. I did Sly Stone, the one where he's jumping up in the air uh, high, like high on you. i'm on that or is that i heard you miss me no i think it's high on you yeah <laughs> yeah you got it yeah that was yeah. my last or his last in my mind his yeah. last great record yeah yeah yeah, yeah. You know, i never forget when i called up the cvs because that's when they would give out more french goods for fun goods and stuff you can get product for no big deal and I called up there and I said, uh, can I, uh, CBS, well, I had connection with all the labels, so I didn't have to buy anything. You should see my closet. I got a lot of, do you have a lot of those uh, picture albums? I have some. Yeah, I got some good ones, man, that will blow you away. Michael, you name it. But what happened was I called up to CBS to get uh, slide stuff, and they only sent me, I think, three albums. And so I called my buddy in and I, I said, I wanted uh, uh, the Sly Stone catalog. I thought you was going to hook me up and send me the album. He said, man, that's all he had. And one of those was the greatest hits. I was like, yeah, this boy had so many hits. I thought he had all kind of albums. Because I didn't ask him. I just said, send me the uh, Sly Stone catalog. And it was three albums. That's how good that boy was. Yeah. So, like I said, we can do part two of that because I, I, I've I been so fortunate, like I, like I was telling all about, I will, I am going to do a documentary or a, a book or something because just so people can enjoy and get confirmation on like what you're thinking is pretty much what it is and how it came together, it'll make even more sense because like, see, you familiar with stuff, so when I say stuff, you can relate, and now you can go, oh, I get it. That's yeah, why I want you to go back. I'm, yeah, connecting dots, man. <laughs> yeah. You're going to, you're going to, when I, now that I told you those things about it, you're going to say, oh, I even hear it. I can't wait till you listen to street people at the end of the song, where they jump up in the air like that. Yeah. Street <laughs> people. I think that's on, yeah, that's on breaking, yeah. That's on breaking. But all the electric boogaloo was all hand done. That uh, that song that we came up called "I When I See You I Get So Insensitive." We called it "I See You" because he was in the hospital and he was in intensive care. So we we wrote the song off of that, and they're dancing in the hallways and stuff on the electric boogaloo. That song, like I said, that's when I had a chance to really write for the picture out of the box, not having to replace temp music that they shot to when, and it being the dance music. Man, you can't do that. You don't understand, you can't do it. I can make it so much better. Like, when you look at Footloose and some of those big records that sold like that, you know, they they probably had the script and when they wrote it, it's easier. 30 Day, you name it. The real big ones, you know, it was thought out more. I came in the picture, like I said, after they had shot it. And that scene that they edited it together and handed it to me had three different um, temp uh, uh, records, so with three different temples. So I used one for the meat of it, 
used the the more exciting one for my bridge. Then I brought it back to uh, the middle. Then the end was the end of the up tempo one where I kind of clubbed it out. That's how I did it. So now I want you to everybody got homework assignment. <laughs> Make sure you listen to that. Um, street people, and you will see what it takes to put together a soundtrack when you had no idea what the temple was of the other record, other than sitting there trying to clock it and trying to get them to look like they're dancing to it. So if it look a little off, it's because you got knowledge to it now. <laughs> yeah, but now knowing that makes it just the accomplishment that that you know appreciate that much more. I know. Yeah. It, it blew me away. I was like, God, man, how I pull that off? Yeah. yeah. So, Ali, um, is there anything that jumps out at you out of all this that you're maybe the most proud of? Um, well, you got, obviously, uh, the stuff that I did where I have great story. Uh, I'll put it like this to answer your question. Some of the, the fun things that pops out, and they were all about how it went down, was uh, I'll take the Bad Album uh, uh, and the stuff I did with Quincy, because I worked on um, uh, Bad and that Man in the Mirror, which got some credits. See, Quincy would cut with so many people, and he did the best he can, because he's so busy, he's passing it on, so Stuff of miss, I didn't care. It was always fun to do that. But one time when we were in the studio with uh, Michael, I never forget he brought that snake in there called Muscles. If you look up Michael Jackson Muscles, you might be able to see it. It was a, a I think they call it a python. But I can't even get my fingers how thick it was. And I never forget, we were standing on stage. I bet you Quincy got pictures. But it took all the people, we were standing on the stage to just hold it. It was like maybe 10 people uh, just to hold it in our hand. First of all, it was that heavy. And uh, we took a picture of it. And then after the photo, uh, Michael, he was such a prank and funny guy in the studio, believe it or not. He laid it on the the board, because you know how the SS, the first SSL, the SL board, it had those knobs that kind of stuck up. And the snake liked the way that feels. So I <laughs> said, so this big old snake going across the board, and everybody was like so afraid. I'd never forget everybody's face. That's silly, but that's one of the funniest remembering <laughs> that happened, because Michael thought it was so funny. Because everybody know him as this shy person. And I discovered what that was uh, when I did the Toya's album. And I would have to come up to the house. And Michael would be upbeat in the studio. He would be upbeat. Then we did the listening party for the Toya's album. Um, it's the gray one, I think. I forgot the name. Isn't it just called Latoya Jackson? It could be, but it had a subtitle too. It's the gray one, the Toya Jackson. The yeah, I know. I had one. I had that record. Yeah, and it, uh, it's got "If You Feel the Funk" on it. Yeah, that's the one that I did where the record label were calling me up, going, "Man, why didn't they put that out as the first single?" I said, "Well, her brother produced the first single. What do you think?" <laughs> so everybody, instead of how politics go, instead of listening to what they think radio might want, which should be the best single for your first single, put it out. But they were so politically, well, Michael, this is Michael's sister. Let's just put this one out first. So I got a lot of airplay. I'm gonna turn this off, sorry. I, I remember at the time, I was really surprised how, how funky LaToya, you know, was made on that track. Yeah, that's right. I had I had the work rock. It was her first record, warmest, nicest, full of energy. Wanna wanna work hard, cause see for Latoya, I, cause they would always try to give her a hard time. The bar was so high for her to come out there, 
you know, in the stuff. Because I even remember Janet being at the house when I would come over, and I was playing the same game. Janet would walk by, and I'd go, hi, you know, when I should have been saying, hey, let me produce you, too, you know? And she would just walk around because she was just active, and that was when they were living uh, before Michael bought his big man mansion, which is another day uh, that we had fun with. And that's why I hate it with all this stuff. And I'll share something very positive to that. Uh, when he was at, um, what's, what's the name of the place? Uh, Wonderland. Uh, I went out there with Paul, because I was managing him at that time also. He was putting on some guitar tracks for Michael. And Michael took me, his face is so big, he had one of his workers take me on a tour at Neverland. It was like a museum, so he had all this stuff that Disney had did. They had uh, made the control room and had all the animation. Then he took me out, and I got on the Ferris wheel so I can capture everything. So I'm on this big old Ferris wheel seeing all the grounds and stuff, and I was able to meet uh, Jabbar, which was Michael's uh, giraffe. And he named the Jabbar after Korean, you know. So that was a good name. And this this giraffe was the most beautiful animal. I, I wish I knew where what they did or where it is. That it had big brown, gorgeous, deep colored spots all over it. It was just so well taken care of. You can tell, just gorgeous. Getting back to when I went after I got my tour. I went in and Michael would always have movies that were either coming out or being out because, you know, he couldn't go to theaters, so he had the power to get stuff. They wanted him to have it. So I'm sitting inside Michael's theater and all by myself, and then I'll tell you about the go-karts. I'm sitting there watching the, the, the movie, the film, and I look behind me and I see this big glass like a, a, a vocal booth, so you understand, this great big glass with all these beds in the back. And guess what they were? They were hospital beds that Michael had made for people that were could not, and particularly kids, could not see movies firsthand and would not always have to see it through previews and broken up. Mm. And I'm saying, that's the Michael I know. Because he had so much love to give to them. That's why he was always doing stuff. He wasn't in fear with them because you can imagine Michael being young like that. Like I was telling when I did uh, the Spike Lee thing with uh, the 25th anniversary of Bad. You should check that out uh, that Spike Lee did uh, on Michael. I, I, I did an interview on that. I was sharing, a, I think I shared that in there, and because I didn't like that rap he was getting, because I just imagine being that successful, and then a person, oh, everybody's always like this at you. Everybody, from manager, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I started noticing that I would see a different Michael in the studio or at the house where I would come over and work with uh, Latoya. Then, in public. So when we, I'm jumping around because I'm trying to make it go faster, but when we had the, uh, the, um, uh, the listening party for Latoya, Michael was there and I walked in, I said hi, and he was like this. He didn't say nothing. So the first thing I did was I looked at, uh, I looked to myself, and then I saw Reby, Jermaine, because I've always did their records anyway. And no one was really engaging with Michael too much. And then, so I took a step back. You know how we always quit to judge? Oh, well, he's too important to speak to me in public, whatever. That's not it. He just, he was just shy and just was like this to his own family, just quiet. Introver not jumping introverted. Down, yeah. Well, and then. That same guy, that's when I took a step back and started looking into him, just like all these people that was reading the news and stuff. I'm, I'm saying to myself, yeah, I don't know, Michael. His intent 
opposed to how I look. You know how you can just make the wrong move? Because I had to go through that through um, coaching girl basketball. You can't have the appearance of something that looks so. It's better just to stay out. Like I, like while I was coaching, I never even went near that line. I was seeing one of the girls that just had to wait, you know, because you don't want nothing. And being uh, a man of color, dealing with uh, uh, females and some of these things that you hear coaches have done, I didn't need that. And for Michael to be a celebrity and got involved with all that stuff about the kids and stuff, it goes way further than that because that boy is nothing but serious, wanting them to have everything. If a kid say a lollipop, I need a bicycle, that boy would get it in a heartbeat. And I thought that was so nice because those people that are ill or handicapped, they always have to get it last. And I thought about him um, spending the money because he had the real kind of stuff that a doctor would need if he brought him in there to do that. And I'm saying, okay, y'all doing all this interviewing on his property and then no one mentioned uh, that part of the house when they were showing the house that time when the stuff was hitting, they were taking us around. Not one time, because I was waiting, not one time did they show that. And that's weird enough to bring up, since you want to bring up something weird. But if you don't know what the intent was and how it was used and why it was even there, you, you can easily paint any kind of picture for it. So I, I, that I, was the part. I, I didn't even watch that documentary that was recently yeah. about all his, you know, things. I don't, I don't spend my time. I, on I that. even went, I even went. Um, if you look at People Magazine on the cover, where they have all the brothers sitting, if you look to your left, you'll see me, and you'll see Elizabeth Taylor. That's me in the front there. I, I, I spoke at him, and I spoke at uh, Rick James. I was looking for a property for Rick James. You know, I do real estate, Hollywood Estates. I do real estate out in California, and I was looking for a house for Rick. And Rick was in the car with me. And uh, backtracking a little bit on the interview, we said when I uh, met Rick, he was always compared to me, but he was more popular than me because we both wore braids. Mm -hmm. And uh, they thought he was always teasing me about giving me, I said, no, I had braids before you. We would tease each other. Anyway, I'm taking Rick around to look at a place. And he kept asking for gates. He said, Ali, I want gate. So he threw that in the mix. I had looked up all his properties. All of a sudden, he wanted to be behind gates and stuff. What, what year about are we talking, Ali? Uh, when, he, when he passed. I forgot what year. So in the 90s. Uh, when, when Rick James passed, I brought that up at the... At, at his um, uh, home going, at the funeral, I said, you know, guys, Rick was quiet, but i never forget him making that call to me and not knowing, because Ray called me up, Ray Parker Jr. called me up and said, hey, Ollie, did you hear about uh, Rick? I said, no, I'm out looking for a place because we're going to look at property. He all of a sudden called me about Gates, so I'm out here starting over again trying to find my place. He said, well, you can stop looking. I said, what do you mean? He said, um, he passed, man. And that's when my phone started ringing and everything. Really good guy. Uh, I had a lot of fun with him, again, because of the braid thing. And let me see. Uh, I was trying to see. I was going to show you the one that we had, because both of us wore our braids down. I got a picture. You know, I, I, well, I, Stone City I, I Band, picture. too. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the whole thing. You know, so I was a part of the beginning of that. Now, he's the only one I didn't tour, but I did a lot of studio work where I, I did not travel with him because, you know, I was in a good position not to leave town, and it was going to cost you. <laughs>